Hi everyone, my name is Arson. And personally, I like represent the youth and the youth who are just like me. And um, based off of what he said, how the system is so big and bigger than us, I think we have to attack the system in different ways. Of course, it will take a whole huge effort to stop the new Jim Crow and get national attention on the issues because our country is concerned about war and other things. They think that this matter doesn't matter at all, but it does because it, some people are in jail. We are not only some people with their freedom, mostly in some bad areas like Chicago, wrongly. We're losing all our leaders, future politicians, lawyers, and you brought up a good point that I had right now next to WOW, the devaluation of black life. Mm -hmm. If our lives don't matter and people go away a lot of stuff in jail, then it's just going to be bad for the whole country. Um, and the demographic is changing. The reason President Obama got back to the White House again is because the demographic is changing and voter suppression hopefully be stopped and there's huge efforts all around the country. But the biggest thing is I think you've got to change the dialect because some, so, so often people on my college campus say racist things that they think are a joke and laugh and I have to like kind of step out of the room, make a scene and let them know like that's not cool and people don't have certain conversations around me. They switch up how they are when I turn around. If the whole country together acted in that way, it would be a big change just off of that alone. People would uh, see the situation be more sincere to it. A lot of people in suburbs don't know how bad it is to the city. I have a friend who wants to hear about my stories growing up, and he's just so amazed. He sits down with, like a little toddler and listens to uh, <laughs> My neighborhood, Bay Street, good man area, there's cops all the way around. They're just posted. There's shootings all the time. Every summer is so dangerous and so bad. A shooting in my house, outside my house actually last week. The cops are always at the corner store, and they do. They come by and sweep people up. My brother was involved in um, some criminal activity, but didn't get enough help. The system fell on them. Don't point the finger at him. There's going to be more help. If people saw that issue, put more energy into helping it, my brother got a job the first time. If he got more help, he wouldn't have got it back. So the second point, I think, is um, help people transition from out of the jail system. Because people go in for like having weed, but they come out much tougher, much more dangerous, with a different yeah. mindset. They're angry at the whole country. So we help them better with not just housing and food, but getting their lives back on track, getting that system type of education. Our veterans come home and then they get benefits. Our people come out of jail and get benefits as well, because their lives is important. Um, and I wrote a lot of points, it seems. Um, and let people know that this issue is real relevant, as I said before. Um, make the poor communities in this area of Rochester be aware of what they're going through because there's a lot of parents who aren't good parents and they won't make a change themselves. But if you tell a teenager who's in high school who's skipping class that if he doesn't get his act together, the system's going to chew him up, then he'll awaken and then together with every other person in the area, there could be a movement. A lot of people don't see that there's a problem. They're used to it. They grew up that way. But they don't know what could happen with their efforts. Um, and just get involved. Get involved as much as you can. Parents need to be held more accountable. With all this, with a diverse attack, I feel like so many things that police brutality, racial profiling, all this could be changed. If we held our cops more accountable, if we, the parents and students from high school got together, got involved, organized better, there could be good things out there. Okay. 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 Brother, next to Arthur, if you could say your name before you oh, speak. Yes. Uh, I'm Brian. Hey, Brian. And, um, I wanted to um, come back and, and sort of echo what Reem said earlier uh, about the, uh, the book Michelle Alexander's New Jim Crow, because the analysis, uh, reading that really pulled a lot of things together in my mind. Uh, a lot of pieces came together in terms of understanding what's happening, and, and especially uh, <coughs> understand the role of the war on drugs mm -hmm. because that has nothing whatsoever to do with stopping people from using chemical substances uh, which presumably you know civil libertarians would you know whatever you do is your thing presumably but anyway but, but they it, it's because they don't do that it's, it's a mechanism for incarcerating black people is, is really what it is and that's what the argument of the new Jim Crow is about um, and, and understanding that, you know, there are people who use drugs and it's, it's um, 
the, the making that illegal by definition turns anybody who uses it, whether they're addicted or not, or whatever, <coughs> into a criminal. And how do you catch a criminal? You make somebody empty their pockets, and if they have anything on them, you arrest them. I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's astounding. Uh, it has nothing to do with stopping or helping people who need help, you know, alcoholics, uh, opiate addicts, all people who want to stop a bad habit. It has nothing to do with that at all. It's all about controlling people, and particularly controlling black people. And that, that, that's really the role that we've got to understand it because you've got to throw out all the self-righteous crap, I'm sorry, all the stuff we hear about drugs and the war on drugs as being like some sort of crusade we must be part of. Because think, think of the crime that goes on in the shootings and, sh and stuff like that. If drugs were legal, like alcohol, would anybody be getting shot? <laughs> you know? People, people are alcoholics. It's a bad health problem. People have bad lives and they drown it. You know, and I understand that one wants not, them not to do that. But people don't get shot going down to buy a wine, I mean, a, on a wine deal or, you know. Um, so, so if you get rid of an illegal drug trade, you get rid of all the crime that is the excuse for making certain neighborhoods and certain areas no-go zones and the free fire zones for the cops. And, and, and you're right, they plant them, so they, they're there all the time. They, they, they rotate in and out, and, and it's, you know. So, so this is just kind of as, as background to understanding what's going on and, and orienting ourselves. Uh, we, we should ideologically think through how to reject the war on drugs rhetoric and, and come up with a, an understanding of what kind of neighborhoods can we strive for where people look after each other rather than call the cops and make the cops be the, the element that does what happens. In the back. Um, could you introduce yourself? Oh, my name is Billy. Yeah. Ah. Billy Ward. <laughs> you know, it's just that, um, you know, now today, um, you know, as you were saying, Brian, you know, alcohol is socially acceptable because they've been, you know, using alcohol with anything, you understand? And then um, the war on drugs, for me, this is just my thought, the war on drugs, it's a billion dollar business. Man, these people ain't gonna let this thing go. They're gonna keep on throwing this stuff on in here because it's a business, man. You understand what I'm saying? And they, they turn it and move it into a, the inner cities, but don't get me wrong, it does spread to the outer hill in this town. You understand? But it's just that, you know, sometimes they get into the inner city because these people, man, they want to get out the ghetto, you know, they want to have a little money, you know, they see these things, you know what I'm saying? So, in, in some ways, they're trying to say, man, this is the way out for you, but it's a trap for you, too. You understand what I'm saying? So, uh, by it being a trap, whereas you're out there trying to sell it, you understand what I'm saying? They get caught, they're going to jail. You understand that then it's like we racially profile because sometimes people think that it's just in a black neighborhood. Drugs are just here. But it's not, man. The government and other people in high places got their fingers in this cookie jar. You understand? They make it billions of dollars. You know, it's just like going back to the days, man, when uh, Frank Lucas and them, you know what I'm saying? Um, them guys, man, they were using the government. Put dope in body bags, bringing it over here, distributing it all over. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, it's like, um, for me, I'm like, how can we fight this thing? Uh, that's true enough, we do have to educate our young people. And sometimes it's hard, man, you know, because they want to do what they want to do. And, it, and sometimes it seems like you say something to them, it's going in one end, going out the other. Because they seen something else, man. And I'm like, I, the only thing I got to keep on trying. I can't give up, I got to keep on trying because it's going to get through to somebody. It's going to get through to one kid. And if I can get one kid saved, maybe he can get another one saved. You understand? But you got to start off at that one because sometimes I've been wanting things to happen just like that. And it ain't going to happen overnight. But um, these. Uh, these officers and things, man, I just think uh, sometimes these people are not checking these people out, man. You know what I mean? Because these are not people uh, um, 
they're not people like people pleasers, you know, uh, a peacemaker. The officer is supposed to be a peacemaker. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? They don't know the people. They're not trying to understand the people. Mm -hmm. They're just going out here grill. Mm -hmm. It's like you said, racial profile. Just going out grill. Boom. And then when they say, um, and sometimes they say, uh, uh, um, they have to be, uh, uh, if they find, um, wait a minute, let me get my thoughts together. I know what I want to say. But when they say that, uh, uh, um, probable cause. You understand? I mean, they get to say, oh, we got probable cause. You understand what I'm saying? And don't really have no probable cause. You understand what I'm saying? Why you say, you know, because this incident happened to me one day, and uh, the officer said to me, I, was, I went in the store to get my grandchildren some candy. And the officer came up to me and said, hey, man, he said, uh, empty your pockets. I said, I was, I was just coming to get uh, some things for my grandchildren. But I, you know, I said, okay. I emptied my pockets, gave them my wallet, my ID and everything. And they ain't gonna tell me I'm selling dope. I said, excuse me, sir, I don't sell dope. You understand what I'm saying? So he was like racially profiling me, talking about I'm selling dope. I don't sell dope. Even though I live in a, a, a drug infested neighborhood, I don't sell it. You know, so it's like, uh, for me, man, it's just, uh, I don't know. God bless them all. You know, I mean, my mind just goes here and there, here and there, here and there. Please forgive me. I love all of you guys, and I thank you for the support, but I'm supporting you back. You understand? Because, you know, it's something that we need to do, man. I think that we need to keep on, uh, as you say, we need to keep on with these marches, keep on going forward, because the children is looking at us, too. They're looking. Like, what is the people doing? <laughs> Let me find out. You understand? that then we got the young folks, the teenagers, people, are, uh, the children are graduating and stuff like that. Yeah, man, and they still look. Look at that young man over there. I'm so proud of him. <laughs> Arthur, you understand what I'm saying? Because he's a young man, and he's right here. <laughs> he's not out there selling drugs and doing nothing, man. Because... Okay. <laughs> I got to stop. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, go ahead. <laughs> I'm going to stop. But I love you all. Thank you very much. Yeah, you I've got three hands on my list right now. And next is you. Um, and you'll be I'm Sean, I'm a member of the ISO. And um, it was great, Benny. Thanks for uh, your comments. And um, I have an interesting kind of situation with me. I live in the city now, in not a very nice area. I lived on King Street for a few years. And now I live over um, kind of by U of Bay. And uh, more, it's more towards. Uh, Norton, but I mean Goodman and Norton, so it's not quite as far down. But I get a form of reverse, not reverse, it's still racial profiling, I guess. It's just not the normal kind that you think of. So I've been pulled over a number of times in my neighborhood. I was just pulled over the other day, four blocks from my house, because I'm white. Yes. <laughs> so it's not only do they use um, racial profiling against um, different minorities, different people of color, they also use it to keep us separated. Yes. Yeah. All right? And they don't want us to come together in right. meetings That's like right. this right. and invite right. each other to say, because then people like me or people, um, you know, who may have never seen the other side of things get a chance to see really what's going on. Mm -hmm. And we see, okay, this is what is really happening in our inner cities. And it's not what we see on TV. These are the lives and the people really affected. So I think coming together, and um, organizing obviously is a huge thing and breaking down those color barriers, those, those things that the, um, the elites in our system, the police, the government put up as barriers to keep our um, different groups apart. We need to break those down, come together, and that's how we can build a broad-based movement that can really do something to change these things. Right on, right on, right on, brother. You next? Um, my name is Felicia Abrams and I am um, I am a firm believer in it takes a village to raise a child. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I find is some of our kids don't have a sense of pride. They don't know who they are. You know, a lot of times, even d during black history, if you, if you mention um, Sojourner Truth or if you mention somebody that um, has done some things to, to bring them to where we can be today for our own freedom, mm -hmm. some of them don't even know who they are. And, and 
it's it's in and we talked about dividing up families this has been going on for years even since slavery but as long as they're breaking down and dividing up families pulling fathers out kids don't have that sense of pride what if they did it to my daddy i'm gonna be in the same little place and i'm not gonna find my way out but if we can just reach these children i'd like to see mothers just mothers organize something and start walking around. Just as mothers, because if we can give the respect back to the kids and have them, if we show them respect, they're going to give respect. And as I was talking about black history, we have these billboards all over Rochester. I'd like to see the... There should be black history on every one of them. Yes. In, in February comes, when black history comes, give these kids a sense of pride. Mm -hmm. We walk down Park Avenue, I see beautiful uh, uh. statues. <laughs> I see places where you can um, um, sit on the benches. Mm -hmm. I even walked into a tiny little alleyway between writer's books and an African store. And in the walls was... Um, in stone was Langston Hughes and beautiful writing underneath his name. And then I believe there was, um, somebody help me, was it Mahalia, uh, um, May Maya Angelo, and then there was Tupac. Them kids don't even know that exists. Mm -hmm. I didn't know it exists. I just happened to be walking around crying for whatever reason and walked through that alley. You know, so there's just things that, little nuggets. There's so many things that maybe we could do, start small, and just, I mean, why isn't there a bust of a Fre uh, Frederick Douglass on Jefferson? Mm -hmm. Come on now. Mm -hmm. Why isn't it? Somebody said there's a, uh, um, help me out, um, fountain downtown that says, have a drink on me. Well, years ago it said, have a drink on me because it was for Miss Jane Pittman. It don't say it no more. You know what I'm saying? Things that give us back our pride. We should be a prideful people. And for some reason, it's been chipped at and chipped at from the fathers to the mothers to the children. And we should give our children back this type of pride. So that's just something I wanted to say. Mm -hmm. All right. You next, and then on the couch. All right. Um, so I'm Ben, and I got a little comment about um, how they um, get people back into the system once they've gotten out. Um, so about a week ago, I read on the internet that the government recently decided that they're going to make all ex-felons um, ineligible for food stamps. <laughs> and I looked at that article a little bit, and I saw something that surprised me. Uh, apparently, they had already made all ex-felons who were in there for drug offenses ineligible for food stamps. But you know, if you murder somebody, it's no big deal. You get food stamps, <laughs> that's fine. <laughs> um, and, and then, of course, ex-felons can't get uh, good jobs. Um, so then what do they expect people to do? Um, you know, they, they can't work for... A living, you can't get food that way, you can't get food stamps. So, you know, yeah, um, and whatever, whatever you think of our government, it's obvious that they aren't all completely stupid. They realize what they're doing here. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Uh, um, uh, this is intentional, this is mm -hmm. part of a system. Mm -hmm. yes. mm -hmm. Thank you. I've got only one speaker on my list. Can I, I'll have her on the couch first and then you follow. Hi, my name's Ari. Um, yeah, there is a couple of things I wanted to say. Uh, they say like, um, there was one really great quote that I heard during the, uh, the, the, the Much For You Actually Benny. Um, they say like their slogan for the place is to protect and serve, but they never say who. <laughs> so, I really liked that one. That was good. In terms of like probable cause and like BS probable cause, it's just like, it's their word against ours and you know, how are you really even going to fight that? Like, I make it kind of impossible. Um, prisons are basically crime schools, and, you know, once you get into the system, like, like Brian Reeves said, it's extremely difficult to get out, and usually once you get out of prison, you know, your life is completely drastically changed, or, you know, your livelihood is ruined. There's no way, um, you know, sometimes that the only outlet is to, to get into more crime in order to even, like, survive. And so that's terrible. Um, 
children whose parents are victims of police violence like grow up in this like world of like distrust. Like how if your parent was murdered by a police officer, how the hell are you going to trust like anyone, like any kind of authority figure ever? And how are you going to feel safe in this world? Like you know, it's it's you against the world. It's it's a very skewed kind of you know vision of, of reality. Um, and I wanted to also point out that like in uh, in the conference that we all went to, or some of us here went to uh, last summer in Chicago, um, same one that's coming up this summer, uh, there was a really great panel of um, families that were afflicted by police violence, um, mostly um, parents uh, that had children that were murdered by police, and it was a really amazing and emotional um, uh, plenary because, you know, there were at least five, four or five families um, up there talking about these issues, and. Uh, you know, if, if, it, if there wasn't an outlet like that, um, you know, they would just all be isolated and alone. And, and it's, it was really wonderful to see them brought together. Like, it was very empowering for everyone there. And so we have to keep that kind of momentum going and try to find, you know, and create these spaces that, like, people feel safe, like, talking about this stuff and opening up. Uh, the, the rally that we had in your neighborhood was amazing. Um, you know, we were marching around in the 19th Ward area and like, you know, and children were coming out like, what's going on? What is this? Yeah. What's going down? Like, it was really, really powerful and not a cop in sight, if, you know. Right. Like, they're not That's a cop right. in sight, like, until 15 minutes after everyone dispersed and then, you know, but um, it's just interesting all those different dynamics. Yeah. Hi, I can hear you. My voice is kind of worse. Um, my name is Naina. I'm Billy's wife, and I'm also a pastor. Um, I'm sitting around here and I'm listening to all the different um, um, scenarios about how we can help. As, as Felicia was talking about getting back to where we once were, from number one, is not taught in the school system. Number one, uh, we have to begin to relate to that. Because just the other day, my grandson came home, he goes, Mom, why am I learning about, what did he say, about um, something that doesn't even have anything to relate to me, you know? I mean, for as our culture is concerned, and we as a people, and what I told him, I said, well, um, there's only, they're only going to teach you but so much, because that's what it's geared to do. I said, but that's, like you said, that's when the parents come in, that's when we come in and say, you know what, this is one of your roots. Um, we also realize and understand about the community um, that we live in. I really believe that even, um, we, we're not talking about religion because everyone has their own belief. Um, but we have to begin to realize that this escalates from the inner part of a person. And the reason why that we do have so much diversity, I really do believe that if the community could come together to try to bury you some of these, and I'm talking about the churches, of not of religion, but as a body of people, Protestant, um, Methodist, Catholic, I'm, I'm not talking about uh, uh, we all coming together. How else can we uh, see the community get together unless we come together as a body of people? Mm -hmm. um, and that's power um, and, and the power and the people. I also realize and understand that I was raised in Elmira, New York. So there, growing up with Tommy Hilfiger, well, we were, we, we were raised with Tommy Hilfiger, um, and we could miss it. Um, and to, to see, to move to Rochester in the early 80s and to see so much diversity of color and I was like, wow, I was like scared to go outside. I was like, oh my God. I mean, because I've never seen at one time a whole lot of black people that's conjugating together because this is what they do, okay? Because in Elmira, it's, it's predominantly, you know, mixed people. But I mean, you, you didn't see that. It was there. But we went to doctor's house. We went at cake parties. We did it all. And it wasn't like that, that stereo. When I moved to Rochester in 80, I was like, I'm welcome to a new world. Of so much, you know, people couldn't white, people couldn't, couldn't, of color, couldn't cases, couldn't walk down the street. I've never seen anything like this, and so this was a new thing, a leaf for me, which I, what I really look at and I understand that. Uh, we're talking about not only um, the poverty, but we're talking about fear. Um, Rem talked about um, being able to know your rights. That's another thing that we talked about. People don't know that they have a right to speak. They don't have a right to an opinion um, because of what has happened. And so what we're doing, we're sitting around with discussions, but what can we do? What's the next step? We can sit here and take up opinions. We can sit here and gravitate on this. But what can we do? What's the next action move that we need to do within maybe closing up within the next 10 or 15 minutes? What are we going to do? <coughs> 
Actually, uh, this brother on my right will be our next speaker, and after that, I was just going to kick it back to.